Live from Nassau in the Bahamas, it's theCUBE, covering Polygon 18. Brought to you by Polymath. Hey, welcome back everyone. This is theCUBE's exclusive coverage. We're live in the Bahamas here for day two of our wall-to-wall -wall coverage of Polycon 18. It's a security token conference, securitizing, um, you know, token economics, cryptography, cryptocurrency, all this is in play, token economics, powering the world. New investors are here. I'm John Furrier, Dave Vellante. Our next guest is Nathan Epin, who's the Chief Investment Officer for Arcadia Crypto Ventures. Welcome to theCUBE. Thank you very thanks, much, John. Thanks for, thanks for joining us. Thank so, you, excited to have you on for a couple of reasons. One, we've been talking uh, since day one, a lot of hallway conversations, small, intimate conference, so we've had a chance to talk. Folks haven't heard that yet, so let's kind of get some of the key things we discussed. You are very bullish and long on, on, on cryptocurrency and blockchain. You guys are doing a variety of deals. You're also advising companies, mm -hmm. and you guys are rolling your sleeves up. So kind of interesting dynamics. So take a minute to explain what you guys are doing, your model, okay. and we're going to try to get some of your partners on later. You have a great team, yep. uh, experienced pros in investing, and you got whales, you got pros, so you got a nice balance. Yes, we do. So take a minute to explain Arcadia, your approach, okay and philosophy. Okay, so Arcadia Crypto Ventures, primarily we are a private fund. We invest our own money. We believe in the whole crypto space. We believe this market is expanding and it is growing and it's going to be the biggest thing that ever happened. It's going to be this fusion of internet and PC and mobile and everything is going to go to the blockchain, okay? We believe in the whole tokenization world. Everything is going to be tokenized. So as a whole, we believe this space is going to go very big. Okay, so that's one piece, and because of that, we invest in the space, the whole space. Not one Bitcoin or Ethereum, but everything in the space that makes sense, so people who have a use case. Now, the second piece of it is we advise great founders. We want to get founders to come out and build these new things, because this is the new internet or the new era, and people have to come out and build these things. And so many of them are traditional businesses, and we have to explain to them why this matters, why you, know, you should come to this space and be decentralized and reach the whole world. Because initially the internet came, the idea of the internet was you know, everybody gets information. Now information did get everywhere, you, know, you don't have to worry whether a mailman is there to deliver your email anymore, even if he's, it's a Sunday, your mail will get delivered. So that part was good. But now you have these few companies that's holding all your data. It's okay for most people, but they they do censor a lot of people. So that is one point, that's censorship. So we want a censorship resistant world where everybody's ideas get out. So that way, they, we believe that's how this whole internet space itself is going to change because of that. See, this is, if I explain it in one word, this is the greatest socio-political economic experiment or revolution ever that has happened in humankind. In the history of the world. I mean, this is important. I sat down my opening today, uh -huh. Dave and I were riffing, and Dave and I have always been studying. We've been entrepreneurs, we are entrepreneurs. We live in Silicon Valley, he's in Boston. And so you're seeing structural change going on. So it's not just make money. No. Nope. Um, there's mission-based, uh -huh. younger demographics. So you're starting to see really great stuff. So I want to ask you specifically, because you guys um, are unique in the sense that uh, you're investing in a lot of things, but startups, pure playing startups, mm -hmm. which had only one path before, or yeah. two paths. Yeah. Cash flow financing, our venture capital. Okay. So you, that's a startup model. The growing companies that are transforming their growth business with token economics, those are what everyone wants. Those are the, the best deals. Okay. Then there's like the third deal. Well, we're out of business, throw the Hail Mary, we pivot. <laughs> right? So categorically, you're starting to see the shape of the kinds of swim lanes of deals. Okay. Okay, pivoting, that Hail Mary, okay, you can evaluate that pretty much straight up on that. Startups need nurturing, right? So yeah. the, you know, the VC model actually works really well for startups because mm -hmm. the product market fit's got to be developed, you got cloud computing so you can go faster. So you guys are nurturing startups. At the same time, you're also doing growth deals. We do. Explain the dynamic between those kinds of deals, how you guys approach them, what's the dynamic, what are the key things that you're bringing, is it just packaging, is it tech, so on and so forth. So with a lot of people when we are in the, on the advisory side, so we, we you know, primarily we look at the founder and their tech. What are they trying to solve? That is key, you know. You can't, you know, if it's a turd, you can't, you know, package it. No matter how you package it, that's not going to work. You can't package okay. dog, you know what. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> yeah. okay. So that's one, one thing that we look at. The founders and their idea. Now, 
their idea, can it be decentralized? Okay, some models are meant to be centralized maybe, so it, it doesn't work, okay? okay? Like, see, it, it all boils down to, when we break it down, we, we look at it, okay, do you have an asset? Behind the scenes, is there an asset? And is that asset being transferred among parties? Mm -hmm. If you have an asset and it's being transferred, is there a, some central mechanism in between? Because if there is a central mechanism in between, that means you're gonna be paying rent to that, okay. All right, you have these things. Okay, great. Now you, you have your asset. Do you have that in-between party? But in some of them, like, let's say you have money in your pocket. You walk, it falls down. Somebody else picks up the money. It's his. It's a bearer asset. Okay? So that's where Bitcoin solved a very big problem. Right? It, is, it was a bearer Unless asset. they hack your wallet, then they take your money. Right. <laughs> no, that, that happens in real life too, right? <laughs> Somebody can take money from your wallet. Right. So yeah. it can happen in Bitcoin. They, they can yeah. hack your wallet. All right. So Bitcoin was solving that problem. Now the second piece is a registered asset. And I mean by registered asset is, take your car. You buy your car, you go to the DME, stand in line, register, there's a record updated in the DME, in their central database. If somebody steals your car, the car is still not his. It's only if they can change the record over there in DME, then it becomes his. Now there, maybe you do want the DME to be there. Or maybe we can, but the DME being there, now you have a problem. They're going to charge you rent, and they can decide, oh, you know what, John, I'm not going to give him a license or a car in the state of California, or they can decide, right? So that is where now you decide, do you want to go the centralized route or the decentralized route? So we break it down to So it's going asset. to be a fit for decentralized, I get that. Yeah. Let me ask you a tactical question, because sure. I know a lot of entrepreneurs out there, they're watching, they'll, they'll hear this, a big strategic decision up front is obviously token selection. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty clear that security token works really well okay. for funding and whatnot. Then there's a role for security token. Okay. I mean, uh, utility token. Yes. So do, do people, should they start from a risk management standpoint, a new company? Mm -hmm. So let's just say we have an existing business. Okay. Entrepreneur says, hey, you know what? We're doing well. We're doing um, you know, $10 million in revenue. And you know, I want to do tokenized because this is, we're a decentralized business, perfect fit. Okay. Do they start a new company or do they just use the security token with their existing So I, I would suggest usually at that time, okay, that's more of a, uh, uh, it's very a legal question at that time, okay? I, I don't know if I'm a lawyer to answer that, but you know, I tell them, okay, you have a business. You, you have, the business model is going on. If you're happy with it, let that be there. Make a new company, okay? If your business model was not doing good, you might as well start from there because you figured out it's not working. But again, at that time, we, we, we tried to come up with this question. Are you trying to put a, the old wine in a new bottle kind of thing? Yeah. If the wine is old, it ain't going to work. You know, you have to get to that realization. So, so here, the people, answer... People are being sued. So mainly the legal question is, <laughs> do I want to risk the... Yeah. All right, let me hop in here. I wanted to ask, go back to something you said sure. about censorship. Okay. I had this conversation with my kid the other day. I was explaining, you know, Google essentially censors your search results based on what they think you're going to click on. Yeah, they do that. And he's like, well, and he thought about it. He said, okay, yeah, they kind of do that. Okay, so that's an underpinning of we're going to take back the internet, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I just wanted to sort of clarify that. From an, uh, from an investment philosophy standpoint, you're technical, yet you don't exclusively vet, bet uh, or invest in infrastructure protocols and you know, dig deep into what you read the white papers, but you don't, there are some folks out there, hedge funds, et cetera, all they do is just invest in utility tokens. They're trying to invest in stuff that's going to be infrastructure for the next internet. Your philosophy is different. You're saying, we talked about this, we don't really know what's going to win, but we make prudent investments in areas that we think will win, and we like to spread it around a little bit. Why that philosophy okay. it may reduce your return, but it also reduces your risk. Maybe you can describe that a little sure. bit. Sure. See, in general, Picking winners in the long run has been, it's, it's a proved fact that nobody could pick winners. Like, if you take active hedge fund managers, uh, active hedge fund managers in the long run, like the, if you take 10 to 20 years, they lag the S&P. So if you had money, if you give it to an active hedge fund manager, instead of that, you just had to buy the S&P, you would have beaten 93%. That's Buffett's advice. Buy a so, so Buffett, 500. Buffett made a yeah. bet with Todd and you know, they did a 10 year bet for a million dollars or something where, you know, so take Warren Buffett for that matter. His fund is lagging too. In, in reality, all his stock investments are down. Like he put it in IBM right. at 200 bucks. It's after eight years, it's at the 143 or something, right? So realistically, so you, there's a lot of luck element, okay? You can do all the analysis and you could still end up buying Enron, Lehman, 
and their skins, yeah. right? Right. Yeah. And at that time, see, they were using some models that they knew till then. Most people, investment comes from, you know, you have this background that you know, okay, this is what I look at. Cash flow, discounted cash flow. Great. If that is there, price to earnings, I'm going to buy. But then when Amazon and all came, most of the traditional investors never invest in Amazon. They were like, oh, it's a loss-making company, you know? Right. They're never going to survive. But they forgot the fact that companies like that, there was this network effect, and once the people are there, at any point, Jeff Bezos can just turn off the switch and take off the discount. You're not going to change, you know, your shopping from Amazon at that point, right? Because this month I lost my 15%. You're so used to it. So right. people miss that. Nowadays they see that, but when it came to blockchain, they're like, oh, no, no, this is a fact. That's what most people So think. we talk about discounted cash flow as a classic valuation methods. I see guys trying to do DCF on these investments. No. I mean, we were joking about that. <laughs> <laughs> How do you, what's your reaction to that? Well, we, <laughs> if anybody is saying that, if they come to me and I'm like, I'm like I, you, I don't know what Kool-Aid did you drink at that point, okay? Because what cash flow are they discounting? There's no cash flow. It's not like you're going to get dividends on these tokens. There's no dividends. It's like, can you find out how many people are going to use it? What is the network effect? And again, for that, a lot of people are coming with a lot of these matrices or matrix right now, but I think even that, they're trying to retrofit into it. They're like, oh, you know, I can use this matrix, you know? Yeah. But really, so we don't know. people tend to want metrics. Dave and I talk about this all the time. When people part with their money, they need to know what they're betting on. So the question is, when you look at an investment, when you spend cash, when you, when you write checks, uh -huh. what is your um, valuation technique? Do you look for the, how do you play that long game? What's the criteria? And besides like the normal stuff, like founders, disruptive, like you got to write the check. What's yeah. it? Okay, buying a token. Okay. It's got to be worth something in the future, obviously. So we look at the we look at that space, okay, where, wherever they are trying to disrupt. Is there a big market, and, or even if it's a niche market, okay? So we're doing, um, you know, an aero kind of an aero chain token, okay? It's a very niche market. It's just the pilots, the maintenance folks, and the charter people or the the plane charter guys. It's a very small market, but that's good enough. Yeah. It's very niche. They can have an ecosystem between themselves rather than you know being incentivized to log the miles and stuff like that, right? It doesn't have to be a very big market. We just look at it, okay, founder is good, he has an idea, it is a space that can be decentralized and people can come in and they can feel that they're part of the ecosystem. See, the whole thing with the token economy and a traditional economy, like let's say I am spending money to buy a stock. So I buy stock, as an investor, what do I want? I want maximum returns. The employee, he wants to get maximum pay, and the consumer who's buying the product, he wants to get it at the cheapest price. So there's a, it's not aligned, okay? The moment you give him the cheapest price, my profits go down. If I increase the employee's salary, my profits go down. So we have, all three of us are totally misaligned. Final Super important point. I just want to think, do you favor certain asset classes, you know, a token, a security tokens or, or, or utility tokens or, uh, you're looking for equity. I mean, maybe just no. We're not, uh, right now, we've moved away from the whole equity right. bonds or any of those things. Right. We are totally concentrated on utility or security token. We don't mind if it's a security token or a utility token. And if it's a security token, are you looking for dividends? Are you looking for at that point, uh, it's some kind of share? dividend. So yeah. you're not expecting equity as no. part of that. We're not expect, token. expect the, uh, equity, but we are, uh, if they are saying, okay, my token, if people buy and if they pay me ten dollars and out of that, you're going to get one dollar back? Okay, that's fine. Uh, I, we don't mind that, okay? As long as it's legal and all those things, right, right, we are yeah. fine because it just makes the process easier. Earlier, you invest and uh, you didn't know when you could get out of your investment. At this point, it's become so liquid at any point of time, within two or three months, the token is listed, people are you know, either buying and selling. We know, otherwise, earlier when we used to do venture investments, we would get into a product, for it's average years. time seven to ten yeah. years to get out, and in the meanwhile, they say great stories. Oh, we're doing great. How do I check whether we are doing? I'm not getting any dividends. Nobody's buying this from me. How do I know where am I? I really don't know. I can I can make these values up and on my Excel sheet and say, okay, we're valuing this company at a billion. So your technique is to say, okay, look, the equity play is the long game, and you need an exit on liquidity, either an M&A or IPO. Yes. Now you have a new liquidity market, so big. you you play the game differently. I won't say spray and pray, but you have multiple bets going on, and so you can monitor liquidity opportunity. Yes. So that's a new calculation. It's a great calculation also, because, see, we're in the market, and now we know at any point of time, we don't have things on our books that are like, we don't know what the value is. Mm. Yeah. We know what that price is, because the market yes. is there, the exchange is there, Whatever people are willing to yeah. pay for us, that's yeah. a price. You know, it's like saying, my house is worth a million dollars. 
actually, it might be worth yeah. to me. It depends on what people are willing to pay me. Right, to exactly. So if, I, if I have to synthesize this, you're taking high frequency trading techniques with classic venture investing and looking at the token from those two perspectives. Yes. In we a way, high frequency trading meaning I'm looking at volatility and then option to abandon and get rid of right. whatever or whatever. The only thing is we're not exist, exiting our positions. We are in the long game. We believe this whole market is supposed to at least reach eight trillion. When we started this whole investing, at that time, the whole market was at six billion. And we said, okay, this market, based on our thesis, is supposed to reach eight trillion. Until then, we keep buying. Okay, but, you, but, but to your HFT analysis, you're not really arbitraging. No, no, we're not doing any of those. Your, the, yeah. Because well, see, they're applying real-time techniques to the token evaluation. Right, right, right. So their their game is try to get into a winner. Yes, right with see, the token. A, a lot of the funds they're doing this arbitrage model. Okay, they're trying to do arbitrage. Yeah, right. So, but the problem is they're missing the big picture at that time. So arbitrage works in a you know a very tight market. Okay, um, so. S&P, let's say, somebody's doing 5% return on S&P, the guy with the arbitrage is coming and saying, I made 5.3, 5.5% or 6%, that's great in the equity world. Now, our returns last year are 10X or 30X or 50X, and if somebody comes and tells me, you know, I made an extra 0.2%, it doesn't really matter to me. I'm like, instead of wasting that time doing arbitrage and paying taxes, I might just, yeah, you're, just you're, hold it. You believe in the fundamentals. We believe in the business. fundamentals yeah. at that point. You guys are in New awesome. York. Obviously, um, Arcadia Crypto Ventures, that's how they get a hold of you guys. Yeah. Um, final question for you to end the segment. As new real pros come in, let's take New York as a right. since you're, since you're in, in New York. Um, the New York crowd comes in, or the Silicon Valley comes crowd. Existing market players from other markets come in here. How, how important is optics packaging and compatibility with the, the sector, meaning I just can't throw my weight around. I'm a hedge fund. Say, okay. We do it this way. I got money okay. because people here have money. Okay. Right. So, yeah, yeah. so what's the what's the dynamic of pros coming in? We're seeing institutional folks come in. Yep. We're seeing real pros come mm -hmm. in. They've never been to Burning Man, yep. so you know they get that <laughs> Burning Man culture exists. <laughs> but this is not a Burning Man industry. Right. Right. Businesses doesn't run like Burning right. Man. Right. Maybe it should. Maybe it, well, that's a right. debate we'll have. Your take. So, <laughs> the new funds that are coming in, so they have a fear that they have missed out. They are missing the picture that this is just the beginning, okay? So they've seen that this industry has gone from six billion to 500 billion in a year, or a year and a half. They're like, oh my God, I miss it. It's got to be over. So, so, I have to write these big checks to get this. We don't write big checks. We write much smaller checks because we believe that if a founder is raising money, he has to raise it through smaller checks from everybody. That means all those people are really interested in this and they're all of them really want the token to go up whether it's the investor the user and the employee who is working there because all of them their interests are aligned the moment you give a big check so let's say you could raise 10 million from 10,000 people or you can raise it from one person so when the big check is there let's say I go to raise my money there's this fund who's missed and he says here's 10 million dollars okay now I got me and the fund and my tokens Nobody else knows about my tokens. My tokens are as good as valueless, right? Now the fund is looking, okay, I need to exit. Nobody knows about my tokens. The fund is the only guy who has my tokens. He's trying to exit. Obviously, either the market is going to crash or there is no market. And he's like, why did I get into this? Yeah. So he missed that point that you need people around you. It's not just you alone. See, earlier days when- This is your point about understanding how token economics work. Right. Yes. So having more people in actually creates a game mechanic it is. for trading. It, 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 because then you know you're not the only guy in, interested in this. In the early venture capital space, there were these bunch of few venture capitalists who wanted to capture that whole thing and try to sell it to the next guy. Here, I'm, I'm, what I'm saying is, we all have to come in together. We all can be together at the same price which is good because the small person has, the common man has a chance to be a VC right now. Earlier you could never be a VC. I could only see Google after IPO. I could never get it at what KPCB or Sequoia got it at, right? Yeah. I had to wait till they go through Series A, Series B, which they bought at five cents. I would get it at what, $40 maybe? In this case, the big fund has a lot more money than me, but I can have my small 5,000 and 10,000. I can invest in the ICO. Okay, if open. you pick the right spot and you you and you you were there at the right place at the right time because you are seeing guys come in and trying to buy up all the tokens you know, yeah. early on and they're trying know. to do that and yeah. it's it is they don't get it but they will understand yeah. so it, it is a learning mechanism even they will evolve they're like yeah. okay this is not how it works and you have to make mistakes. All right, so I got to ask you fun, one final final sure. question. You brought up uh, this um, more people the better. So we're hearing rumors inside the hallways here that big whales are buying full allocations and then sharing with all their friends. 
Possible. It okay. is possible. So we see some of that behavior. Yep. Dave calls it steel on steel. You know, <laughs> you know, groups. You know, I got. I'm going to take this whole deal down. Okay. We see that in venture capital. Yep. It used to yep. be syndicate. Syndicates. And yep. now you're seeing Andreessen Horowitz doing the whole deals. Yep. That kind of creates some alienation, in my opinion. But right. Right. Your, what's your take on that? I'm a big whale. I'm taking down the whole allocation. It's um, okay. Uh, some of those things are going to happen. Okay. It is fine. The only problem is usually when that happens, the big whale who takes it, he will realize very quickly. He's got to get more people. <laughs> he, he needs more people. Otherwise, he might get maybe he might be able to exit to his yeah. five buddies who were always taking it from him. Now those guys, they also have to exit at some yeah. point, right? Nobody knows about the project. Yeah. Might as well just take a small piece. Even the founders in this case, typically uh, in a token model, founders who have taken 20% or 10% have yeah. done better than founders who took 60% of the whole token. Right. Nithin, great to have you on. Love your business model. Arcadia, Crypto Ventures, they got real pros, they got a whale, they got people who know what they're doing and they're active, they understand the ethos. I think you guys are well aligned and you're not trying to come in and saying, this is how we did it in New York before. You no. get the culture, you're aligned, and you're making investments. Great perspective, thanks for sharing. Thank you so much, hey, John. This is theCUBE, bringing so the much, investor Jackie. perspective, live here in the Bahamas, more exclusive CUBE coverage, token economics, huge opportunity for entrepreneurs and investors to create value and capture it. That's blockchain, that's crypto, that's token economics. I'm John Rowe, Dave Vellante. We'll be back with more coverage after this short break.